Hello, mate. Hi. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Decent, decent. Matt, thanks for joining us on Strange Radio. For the listeners out there, why don't you introduce yourself? So, my name is Matthew Kiriakides. I write psychedelic trance under two projects, Continuum and Musalians. And you're a label owner of Mutagen as well? Ex-label owner of Mutagen. It's not completely shut down, but me and my, all my mates that were running it decided we had other things we wanted to focus on in life. But I haven't officially like shut it down with the distributor because you never know in five or six years' time we might end up, you know, <laughs> and we can start it up. Well, it's like... Got you. you. I mean, you release quite a lot on a bunch of other labels. You, you know, I've seen recent stuff from Trick Music, Looney Moon, Aphid. You're pretty prolific anyway, aren't you? Yeah, like Mutalians is on Looney Moon. So I only release, I mainly release with them. But as Continuum, I, I basically release a lot further and a lot broader. But I think there's also more labels with Continuum because there's more of a scope. Mutalians is just night music, while Continuum's got a more broad spectrum, like light and dark full on rather than just being dark. Right, got you. That was something I wanted to ask you about, was why the two different projects? I had Mutagen Records, so I started writing full on because it was what was around me more. But basically what happened was is I had an album, seven tracks ready to go, five, six years ago, or seven years ago now for Continuum. And the classic, I didn't back up, hard, cru- hard drive corrupted, completely failed, lost um, six of the seven tracks of the album, didn't even write music for a while, and then... I was always into writing darker music and I started writing darker music and then it became, I suppose, more popular as I got better at it and wrote more. So it's kind of become my, my more of my focus, but I'm bringing Continuum's focus back as well. Nice. And uh, do you find that gives you like a totally different creative outlet depending on what mood you're in or do you just sort of write as, as and when you feel? How, how does that creative process work with having two different projects? Well, I don't know about other people, but when I write, for example, when I write a track, I kind of know roughly, for example, what key and BPM it's going to be in. And I have an idea of what I want it to sound like before I go into the studio. All right. So, I, so for example, the best way to describe it is if I do an EP, if it's Mutalians, <sighs> I know... I mean, there is a darker and lighter side of Mutalians, but in general, for exa- you, you know what I mean? The lighter side of Mutalians is still darker than, con- than the harder Continuum stuff. So I write a variant, but I, can't, I, I know what I want to do before I get in there. Obviously, right. I don't know 100%, but it's not like 10 years ago where I started writing a track, didn't know what I wanted to do, and then it kind of ended up like that. So you say your creative process is really just taking the ideas that are in your head and then basically trying to put them down. Pretty much. I mean, I suppose my mood does my mood does affect it. One of the best bits of advice I ever got from a producer was actually a techno producer, like Psy Tech Trance. And he basically said they, they write 80% of the creative side of the track in two to three days because your mood might change. And then, the time, after, and then the time after that's just processing and, and sequencing and that sort of thing. Yeah, like Kirsty, my girlfriend, will say that I take three days to write 80% of the creative side and then I spend three and a half weeks to four weeks making it sound I suppose better to come out oh, that's interesting that's interesting I, I I'm a few... sound designer by trade though what I mean no. by trade is I, I I much prefer sound design over uh engineering process you know like the, the mixing and EQing and space work I don't mind it but I much prefer sound design right and uh, and and what do you use to create your your tracks? What are you using for for that sound design? What's your your workstation? Uh, I've got a PC in the studio, and I've got Cubase. And then, I, to be honest, <laughs> to list everything I use is quite hard. But my favourite sort of synthesizers are Serum, the Virus, and Pigments. And then I've got an untold amount of plugins here and there. Some I don't even remember the name of. This is- <laughs> well some of them are just like they they've got a specific job yeah so some of them i'll only use when that job is needed or arises while others are very broad i, I see where you're coming from it's an interesting train of thought that because i was interviewing someone who's going to appear on the radio shortly i won't say the name because uh of the order that it's getting released but um 
they were coming at it from an almost opposite perspective of they were coming at it more from the sort of Brian Eno sound design thing of like finding one you know one sound a really limited palette and then trying to do as much with that instrument as possible and oh, don't get me wrong I could write an entire track with this synthesizer called Serum but recently actually it's funny enough you brought this up recently I I I was reading something that was written in a production forum and um, I know the guy who said this, but basically the guy said it's simple. When a painter paints a painting, they use mo multiple colors and even multiple different types of paint to create different tones and different sort of, you know, different offsets. So when the final piece is done, it's got multiple tones, multiple layers. It's, just, it's the same. And he said it's the same about a synthesizer. Yes, you can use one synthesizer to make the sound. But each individual synthesizer has a, has a flavor that's added by certain aspects of the synth. And each synth has, even software has a slightly different flavor. And I actually went off and tested this and got a bit nerdy and kind of actually agree with him. There are some sounds, there are three synthesizers that I use quite a lot, software. Serum, Pigments, and now Anna 2. All of them are able to do 90% of the sounds that I create. But I've started realizing that certain sounds I like more from certain synthesizers. And I, didn't, I know I've been doing this for a long time. But I didn't even realize it was even the, the type of filter they use can, for example, change the sound. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So, so you're talking there really about the, the, the coloration that comes from using, you know, specific uh, VSTs and, and effects and whatnot. Aren't yeah, you? like even hardware. Each hardware has its own sound. It's what you pay for in hardware. I suppose for the I suppose for the people that are listening that aren't necessarily familiar with production and whatnot, um, you know. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes I get run away with it because it's, 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 it's going to be interesting for them to hear that that's the case, you know, and and maybe even the different sound systems coloring the sound as well, you know, which is you hark back to the early reggae sound systems. They were building boxes to produce their own tunes over to to reproduce their tracks over to color the sound in a specific way. So makes sense to be producing using synthesizers that give off your own signature sound and you know for for producers who've been at it a while that's sort of taken as red but for, for people outside of that scene and outside of the industry i might be news to to hear that that occurs you know that's that's interesting mate so have you found yourself been doing more production during lockdown yeah a lot more <laughs> basically from when I came back from Thailand in January, I've been to one, I went to one party where I played in London, 7th of March. That was the only party we, we went to. In fact, we didn't even really see anybody. So essentially I've been sat in a studio every, every week, Monday to Friday. And even mo in fact, for the last three months, Monday to Sunday, just working every day. That's awesome. So we can expect like a pretty packed release schedule. Is it a, uh... Anything you want to talk about there? Yes, what no. Um, I've got some EPs currently either finished or being finished. For Continuum, I've got an EP with Encore, but it's not out till September. Um, they've got a really, really hectic and busy release schedule. So if you don't, it, whenever you finish a track, it always ends up being a few months to release. And then I've got another EP that I've with the guys called Duke and Gonzo. It's one, one track from each project of mine. That's on Maharetta as well. And then I've got a new... I have got a new Looney Moon EP coming, but we don't have an exact date yet. Uh, we need to finalise it all. You've got some tracks out coming out on Screen Realities, haven't you, compiled by DJ Alexander? Oh, yeah, one from each project. Nice, nice. How do you, uh, how do you know him? Is he, is he signed with the label? or? Yeah, he's a DJ. I've not met him in person, but we, we, we chat quite a lot. It's quite different, difficult sometimes, though, because he lives in America, so time difference. Yeah, we had an interview with an American artist a couple of weeks ago and, um, you know, they were just getting up as I was going to bed and it's, it's interesting working with that time differences, but, you know, it'd be worth it, hopefully. Has he got a good sort of multinational lineup on? I've not seen the, the track listing yet. Yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. I think it's about 16, 17 tracks. Well, the, the track listing is up, I think. It, it's out on Monday. Oh, decent. Decent. Where would be the best place for listeners to catch that? I think most Maharetta comes on Beatport first, the usual Beatport exclusive, and then a few weeks later it will come out in all other stores, including Bandcamp. I think, but I don't know 100%.
Excellent. We'll make sure we post a link to that um, when we post this interview. So you said you've been producing more over the last couple of months, like, you know, seven days a week. Have you been in conversation with any sort of promoters about getting back gigging? What's your, what's your feeling about when you'll be back in action? I haven't spoken to a single person. The only thing that I know I'm doing is I'm going to a wedding in se- uh, the first week of September for um, some really good friends and there'll be some trance played there but it, I, I haven't even began to think about gigs in, in my opinion I don't know you need to wait a mo- I, I want to wait a month or two to see what happens yeah fair play I mean I, I'm assuming like most of the people you've had gigs sort of cancelled over this period and uh... Uh, most of them have been postponed all the festivals have been postponed I've not actually been told that any of my gigs have been cancelled as in they it's been cancelled for this year, but they've just been postponed till next year. Right. I've been lucky. Pretty much every single gig I had for the summer, they've apart from one or two, they've all said they will honour, like with the crowd, you know, who have paid, they'll do the same thing. Ah, decent. So, yeah, postponed rather than cancelled, I guess, is the decent. Yeah. So, so what did you have in the pipeline? I was going to play in the first week of September at Insomnia Festival in Portugal. I had a, um, another gig... In May, I was obviously going to play. Oh well, I th- uh, I was just about to announce I was going to play at Boomtown about two weeks before you know it all kind of got really hectic in the UK. And then um, a few of them they haven't been actually cancelled. They're in September. They're just wow. waiting to see what happens. That's good. I think erring on the side of caution is definitely advised from my perspective. Eh? Yeah. So you mentioned Tribe of Frog. There, you played with them at Boomtown. 2019 didn't you yeah i've played for them three times now i think nice have you played uh have you played at their club venue or has it all been outdoor gigs no i've played um three times for them indoors at their venue as well so they used to be at the lakota when i played for them that's where they were based where are they based now still lakota it's a cracking venue isn't it yeah with uh, uh, you had Eden as well last year, didn't you? How did you? Uh, how did that relationship come to be? How did it come to pass? Yeah, I met a couple of the. Um, I met basically the the stage was run by Subsector, and one of them is called Quadrant. Oh right. He's an artist on Bumshanka Music, and he we we knew each other, and he just asked me, and I just said yes. Fairly straightforward. <laughs> yeah, no, no, like we knew each other for two or three months, and then he said, "Would you like to play?" And I was like, "Yeah." Um, and then you know most of mine are very straightforward that's uh that makes life easier doesn't it i think some people overcomplicate um you know bookings and whatnot and you know as a, as a promoter myself i tend to shy away from booking people that make you jump through you know 101 hoops to book them and that's probably why you're so bookable and, and why you get so many gigs you know good quality music first and foremost and then make it simple for you know for people to book i used them. to promote I used to promote a party called Atom. We did a lot of underground parties over the course of seven years. And I suppose that I did that before I even started producing while I was a DJ. So I think it might have rubbed off maybe. Yeah. Having both sides of the, having both sides of the, um, of the coin, as you, if you want to call it. I try and make it as easy as possible. But if it's something I can't do, I say something. But I try to generally make the experience as easy as possible because neither party wants over the complication or anything like this it's you know it's true true you mentioned your dj now you used to play under the name dj myth was it yeah years ago then i turned it to continuum after a while i kind of just wanted to consolidate everything so do you dj much anymore or what did you just completely pack that in and focus on your production actually funny enough recently um a lot of people are going to boo me for this but i switched from cdjs to using a laptop because i have to carry my laptop around with me everywhere anyway yeah. I don't see a problem with it really, to be honest, these days. You can do so much with it, especially for a genre, for example, like Psy Techno. You know, it's a bit more minimal. You can really mix it in well. And like, mm-hmm. it depends on how you use the software, but I'm not going to get into that particular argument. But <laughs> I, I started DJing um, under a new name called Murky Aura. It's basically dark prog, forest progressive, and psychedelic techno. Nice. It's a. Uh, it... I mean, I, I'm going to have to just bring it back there a second and mention a little bit about the technology because it's something that interests me. And I think that Psytrance is one of those genres whereby, for some reason, people have lent towards using CDs and whatnot a lot longer than other genres. And I, I moved over to using a laptop a while ago. And like you say, people sort of um, 
weren't as accepting and you, you know you, you get the odd comment and whether you sync or not I, I wouldn't get into but for me it just makes sense like you say a you're carrying your laptop around with you anyway you know there's so much more versatility you know the power of the effects and whatnot and also just turning up at gigs whereby you've got a pair of like crusty old cdjs that are you know probably barely reliable and, and 10 years old and i don't think it's conducive to putting out you know a good quality set so it's why I love towards the back end of doing our parties, talking about that sort of situation. I used to, um, I, I learned on a cruddy pair of 800s Mark yeah. ones. So they're not quite 100s. I did learn on 100s first, but then I got sort of refined on a pair of Mark I 800 Pioneer 800s. And so I was all right. But I, I tell you, the first day that I turned up, the first ever live set I ever played was obviously, you know, was quite obviously at our own part at my own party with my friend who organises it. So I'm, I'm playing pretty early. It wasn't like it was late, you know. And the three DJs before me, every time I walked up to the DJ before me, he kept on going, "This is a struggle." <laughs> and then I, I smiled at him and said, "For once, I don't need to worry about that. I've got my laptop, my sound card, and my keyboard. So I have." <laughs> everything that I know works. I've got extra cables in case it doesn't work and I've got a backup CD in case something goes wrong. And he looked at me and just gave me those eyes of you lucky bugger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've had similar, but you know, I think that that's, that's a professional point of view yourself. You just mentioned spares, you mentioned sort of redundancy and backup. I think that counts for a lot. Going back to your partner, Kirsty, you mentioned she DJs. I remember when we booked her for an event, it was exactly the same, you know. Spare. Yeah, where do you think she got that from? Spare, well, this is it, mate. It's, this, you know, wherever it was learned from, it's, it's a good example to young DJs just starting, isn't it? To... Well, she said, the, the way that came about was um, she had a backup because she was going to play her first gig and she said, what happens if the computer fails? Backup. What happens if this fails? Backup. Oh, but I've got to mix another CD that's going to sound like me because I don't just want it to be so clinical. Or I don't want you to do it. I've got to do it. And I was like, that's fine. Backup. And then yeah. first or second party she ever played at, it was in a bar, a friend's barn, and basically they normally built um, a protector for the DJs because there's a mezzanine above the DJ. But someone spilled rum and it went directly onto the table. And I don't remember if it hit or nearly hit Kirsty's equipment, but I taught her to back up and then she just slammed the back up in. It's, it's the way to do it. That's the one thing I would say about CDJs as well. Again, a few of my DJ friends would slap me around the back of the head for saying this, but you're actually more guaranteed to get a smoother, tr you know, a, a, a smoother set because you you've got a backup yeah. <laughs> so you won't have music off for three minutes as long as you've got a backup yeah backup backup mate it's, it's yeah exactly. that's, that's what i say to every, every single time i've ever you know when they ask me when anybody like loads of friends ask me what was what is the one bit of advice you would always give a starting out live act backup it makes sense it makes Doesn't sense how good how new how good your computer is i've seen max with 32 you know like maxed out one 2500 macbook pro i've only got like huh, a 2012 macbook pro and i turn up on stage and nothing goes wrong and they're the brand new you know 10 only five gig old two and a half thousand pound maxed out macbook pro ram starts being weird or whatever reason it's just it's you're not you know you're taking laptops into environments where they're not really made to, made to be used with like when you're in clubs, it's really sweaty and it's like really sort of, what's, it, what's the word? Condensation-y. Outdoors, you can have wind, you can have, you know, sun. I played a gig in South Africa years and years and years ago on my old, one of my old PC laptops and the computer started freaking out. When I mean freaking out, it's like jumping all over the place like it was glitching and it was because of the heat. It was 45 degrees, sun directly on the, the, the laptop for 50 odd minutes. It's going to do things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, like you say, that's good advice for people that are starting out with, with, either playing live or DJing. And in, in the past when I've done some like DJ coaching and whatnot and done some workshops, I've always said that that's probably the easiest way you can separate yourself from the competition because getting gigs it is competitive if you want to be a career DJ. And it's just to be professional, you know, and that instantly when I'm booking an artist or when I see people out on the scene doing that sort of thing, straight away I'm thinking, we'll have you back. <laughs> do you know what I mean if you, if you demonstrate that level of professionality then it instantly puts your head and shoulders above well I think <clears throat> what it boils down to is most of my friends use backups because quite frankly we all learn the hard way I did <laughs> everyone's got to learn <laughs> well yeah yeah we all learn the hard way gone up on stage I did it the worst time possible 
our biggest underground party. You know, we had ridiculous, I think it was close to a thousand people in a venue, three in the morning, going to play my first proper ever live set. <laughs> no backup, come out, sound cards are not read. Uh -oh. Six minutes it took me to sort it out with no music. That bet was the longest six minutes of your life. Actually, no, I didn't really care because I was just trying to sort the computer out. But yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, I was, you know, for the first few seconds I cared. And then I was like, well, this is going to go on for a while. There's nothing I can do about it. So, but yeah, it's, and ever since that day, my friend just came up to me and went back up. And I was like, I oh, know, <laughs> I'm now doing it. And it takes a little bit more time to set it up, but it's worth it when you turn up and something goes wrong. You can just put the backup on. Uh, yeah, that's, that makes perfect sense. Hey, you mentioned playing in South Africa uh, a minute ago. How did you find the difference in scene over there compared to the UK? Oh, this was years ago. You, you travel quite a lot, though. How do you find the UK scene differs in general, or do you find it all pretty uh, unanimously the same? No, it's not the same. So what what country difference to country, you it, it differs. Not drastically in most of them, but it does differ. Yeah, and, and what would you say are the main standout points of, of difference? I don't know if I should say this, but it's mainly actually down to what we do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's how how like controlling or how not controlling the um the the the, the, the police and the governments are. Because if you play, I've played at places like Switzerland where every single you know not Switzerland, sorry, um Sweden where every single person gets searched before you go in, and then I've played more relaxed venues more relaxed countries like Amsterdam where you just get thrown into a club. I didn't even get searched for that one. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it depends on like how relaxed or how not relaxed each country is. There's a certain special something to British festivals and it's to do with how, with the amount of effort that people specifically with festivals go to. Like, you know, they, they specifically have their umbrella that's got a duck on it or one guy, there's, there's, a, there's, two, there's a, a couple in U, UK festivals that paint them, they, they go naked and then, um, and then paint themselves blue. And they're always hanging on to the railing, walking out of it, <laughs> walking up from the main stage, you know, or they, they, they're doing, you know, like proper festival people. Or you get like a, a lot of people dressed with top hats and pixie stuff and, you know, the glitter stuff. And you've got all the different styles, but they, a lot more people, I think, of what I've noticed in the UK, they, there's a lot more of that. In terms of dance music, well, outdoor festival culture, apart from sort of folk festivals, I suppose that's probably because Britain's got one of the oldest sort of heritages of, you know, if you go right the way back to the early rock scene and Glastonbury, you know, right the way through to the, the sort of 60s, we've got probably one of the oldest histories of, of outdoor music festival, haven't we? So I think it's just, I don't know why. I, I actually can't really think why that is. It's just a unique trait of British festivals. We just have that that strange atmosphere, that slightly unique lilt, I guess. Yeah, fair enough, mate. Yeah, like, I mean, I've seen, like, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I've seen, pic, you know, like, videos of German festivals. I've been to a few German festivals where you get the one, like, the odd one or two. You know, like, wait, I'm saying the odd one or two, but you've got, you know, 40,000 people. You, you've got a couple of thousand people that are dressed up across the site, like, really you know, like really colorful or like, you know, things like um, really rainbow and all this sort of stuff. And then you, and then in the UK, I walk, you know, you walk on a UK festival and you could probably say, you could probably spot, you know, you, you, you don't spot that, you spot the person dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get what you say. 8% of the, the crowd are dressed up something, even I do it, even I put on, you know, I've got t-shirts that I only wear when I go out and I've got a top hat and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, you your funny ears and like, you know, all this stuff. I've, I've even worn some glitter when I, me and Kirsty first got together for the first year. <laughs> but I went noisily, I got glittered up for the first time because I hated glitter. My, my gripe with glitter wasn't anything other than I opened my laptop and a friend of mine basically came up to me in an outdoor party and threw glitter all over me while I was playing. And my, I noticed my machine was getting hotter, so I opened up the machine and there was glitter layered all over it. Yeah, that's not, that's not good, is it? No, so that was my only gripe. So I made a rule. I made a rule with Kirsty and all of her friends. Ten minutes before I go on stage, when I'm on stage and ten minutes afterwards, don't put glitter on me. 
<laughs> no glitter zone, mate. Fair enough. Hey, when was the last time you went to a festival as a punter? I'm not playing and I want to go. I'll just pay to go. Why not? <laughs> yeah, decent. And, and is it all side chance you go to? Are you pretty eclectic? Um, Festival-wise, no, it's pretty much side chance. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty, in, pretty heavily embedded in electronic music. Um, I really like the look of Anthropos, which is predominantly, you know, the alternative side of it, like breaks, techno, mid-tempo. I absolutely love mid-tempo music from Shanty Planty. Artists like Eurythmy and um, Quanta and uh, Nanosphere and all these guys. It's really, really cool music. Nice. And um, with your sort of influences for your own productions, are they all electronic as well? Or was there any, yeah. sort, of, any sort of earlier influences from your teen years that, that stretched outside of that sort of trance? That's the funny thing. I've never really gone through a lot of phases. I, I found DJing at 13 years old and then started DJing hip hop and broken beat and things like ninja tunes. And pretty much since then, I've really listened to that. And then it was drum and bass, like breaks and DMB, like things like uh, electronic music, sorry, like breaks, DMB. What sort of hip hop? I was more, I didn't like a lot of the American stuff. I was more into things like uh, the UK artists. But old, what they call old school, like Brain Tax, Skinny Man, Jest, Task Force, Doctor Syntax. I liked Cypress Hill and um, Dilated Peoples, which are American. And I love this label called uh, Stone Spray Records. If you're into hip hop, it's a bit more experimental, most of it. Um, but it's like really amazing. It's a bit like Ninja Tunes, but a bit more American hip hop based. Yeah, big fan myself. But anyone listening to this that's not heard, highly recommend you check out pretty much all those names you just mentioned actually <laughs> yeah, just, I'm, I'm, the, the way i looked at it was and it's it, you know i'm i was i'm, a, I'm like a, a middle class kid who had a few friends who lived in some really rough areas in london but i, I would never call myself ghetto or anything like that so i was just into hip-hop because actually you, you'll probably agree with me hip-hop's the only other music genre i know that has a culture behind it like you know most of my mates that like hip-hop they dress a certain way, like flappy cats, baggy trousers. They all watch manga, like avid manga fans. Some of them, some of them skateboard, some of them graffiti, but they're all into, you know, they're all into the, the stoner movies and all this. It's, there's, it's not quite as much as Psytrance, but there is a little bit of a culture behind it. And I got into it because all my mates did. And I, I just didn't see myself as gangster. So a lot of the guys, in the, especially in America, that were talking about walking around in hoods and all this sort of stuff didn't really resonate with me but I could understand because I had a, quite a few friends that lived in a really rough area of West London I could really understand what the UK guys were saying because they're talking about the UK it's more relatable yeah much more relatable especially as I'd, I had some friends who lived in really bad estates in London so I, I kind of saw this firsthand and how did that progress then through to you know other genres and, and how did you eventually discover Psytrance I kind of dabbled with the sort of rock and metal scene but I didn't wasn't ever really into it properly I just went because some friends went and it was something open on a Wednesday night at first and then I just eventually got into it but not really that much um I got into side chance because I got fed up of drum and bass years ago when it just came jump up I was getting fed up with the music and the scene and as a DJ in drum and bass you don't always have a choice of where to go you know so you I played some pretty rough venues that kind of put me <laughs> off so I kind of just left drum and bass and DJing behind, went and worked for my dad for a year. And then I met this guy called Graham. And 17, 16, 17 years later, I am where I am now. Took me oh. to my first side trance party. I helped him out while he was doing decor a few years after that. Then he brought me, then I started helping out with a party called Anti World that he was helping out at. Then that, then that kind of, I moved on from there and just went through somewhere else. And then one year, a friend of mine came up to me at a bar and went, do you want to start your own party? Yep, okay. Then I started DJing. I started DJing a few years before that. And then it all just, I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I can't pinpoint a point. It just all snowballed. For those of uh, the listeners that perhaps aren't as, as long in the tooth as you and I, let's talk a little bit more about Antiwell. Stainer Street, yeah? I think that was the first one I went to. It was... Um, I know I was I was a tiny bit later, a few years later, where they did like the um the academy and um what was the one in Elephant and Castle? Oh God, no, oh, yeah. oh, I can't remember. The theatre, it was like an old theatre. So the coronet and the academy was pretty much 
the sort of era that I went to it. Nice. I think um, what always sort of excited me about travelling down, because obviously being Manchester-based, for, for us it was a bit of a pilgrimage. It was like, you know, we'd get flyers with whatever we'd ordered, like you'd order a CD or something that month, and you get a flyer and you go, you know, it's pre-Facebook, so it's a case of, right, what's what's on? And you'd hear through the grapevine, it'd be like, oh, Lab 4 are playing, or, you know, there's a lot of crossover as well back then. There seems to be, there was always an acid techno room. You know, there's always a Liberators playing, there's always Lab 4 or someone in, the, like, the energy room, and then Cox Box or someone like that headline in the side trance room. And there's a lot of, obviously, crossover with Goa back then as well. And Yeah, you know, and, like, I'm... Um need to remember this is so far a year so many years ago that that whole genre that shanty plant is based around for example which is known well to me it's known as mid-tempo and like sort of wasn't even a, a style at that point mm. breaks wasn't really side breaks it was more breaks because they used to have a breaks room in dance world sometimes and so you, in side trance i think you only really had sort of the chill out stuff with a very that's a very broad term i know but you had chill out and then you had the main floor yeah. Now you've got now you've got a lot of side trance. You know, a lot of people are writing. For example, like Peter Grosskreutz writes amazing side techno, and you've got a few Xenon artists now, Xenon Records artists who are writing like Clement that writes rolling techno, and you know, you've got so much more crossover these days. And every single electronic genre of music has got a psychedelic side to it now, a subgenre to it. Well, back then you just had. There was a lot more of like hard trance, and there was a lot more parties like that in general. I think that was the trend. You had yeah. like log logistics that was similar. Just logistics. I think Anti World's thing was multi-genre electronic music genre parties aimed more at side trance, while all the others were, you know, the main one would be ma mostly uplifting trance, hard dance, hard trance, and like actual techno. And then you would get a second room with like breaks and all types of progressive music. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, I think you, you might be right there. Do you know what? As you were talking, I just remembered the name of that venue in Stratford. It was a Rex. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I went to one there. It got, I, I kind of started helping out when it was a bit bigger and they got a lot of the Hamega and being, you know, like they'd always have an infected mushroom at the Coronet and an Asterix at the Coronet and an infected mushroom and the Asterix. And then they'd be supported by like Sub 6, Pixel. Yeah. You know, like all these guys. So like back then, I don't, I don't know where, at which point it changed for me musically either, but I just kind of went away from that melodic music quite quickly. And it's not bad. It's just not really my taste. Because even when I was into hip hop, I wasn't into very, I was into the more sort of, not dark, but like deeper and grittier stuff. And it's the same with all, I suppose, all types. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. And you, you found that, well, I, I, I suppose it's, it's almost impossible to have gone to those parties and not had some sort of influence you know i think just being there changes the way that you look at music and i can see why that would obviously influence you but you, you then took it in your own direction haven't you yeah like it was the first ever music i heard i didn't really know much about it until a few years later when the same guy graham started giving me music and cds and then when i actually became a dj i started searching properly like i just used to go to the parties i used to have music at home but i just used to listen to what i listened to and then when i started djing was when i really found all the subgenres, and i don't know i moved I used to like it and then I just moved on. I know a lot of people that say the same. Like, it's quite funny when you speak to some of the seriously dark people, not just producers, but like people who like really dark music. One of my mates who's like totally into like 150 plus, his favorite BPMs at like 165 or something. <laughs> he used to love Asterix. Most of these guys even got into it through the, the, the you know, the more uplifting and the more, um, should be, you know, the fluffier side of it. And I'm not saying fluffy or uplifting in a bad way because some people construed it to be the same as cheesy. It's not at all. It's just more uplifting and yeah, sort of a different vibe to it. It was just a different vibe. That's the thing. I think it's just a very different vibe. Yeah, for sure. When you're setting out to produce your own music, do you, you know, do you have a specific atmosphere in mind or would you write as the ideas came to you? Have you ever been sort of ever see yourself being in the mood to write something more uplifting? I, what I like doing with Continuum is taking like, a, I, I like these days because I haven't re, I haven't really released much as Continuum in the last few years because I've been rebuilding it. But essentially, it's got a similar structure to Mutalians. It's got big FM sections and quite mechanical leads. But where it really differs is I use quite a, a sort of tonally 
harmonic and melodic ish sort of like hits and stabs so it creates a slightly lighter vibe it's not quite as deep and dark yeah so I, uh, the main aspect is similar but i lighten it up with continuum a lot of the time but also it depends if i'm doing a single track sometimes it comes out light sometimes it comes out dark sometimes you know i always have a basic idea of what i want it to sound like but the individual idea is like what type of breakdown i'll do or you know how each section is going to build up is kind of there so but i do know the basic idea of what i want it to sound like but when for example i'm writing an ep or even i'm in the process of started my continuum album while in lockdown uh that's a different matter isn't it because you know like uh, we, i'm gonna get into this because i've been talking about it with a lot of friends I, uh, for me, writing even an EP, if I'm doing more, if I'm doing a two or three track EP, I generally like to have a slightly lighter, funkier one, a slightly darker, deeper one, especially three tracks, you know, have a mixture because it's a, a journey. Yeah. So it's the same with, especially with my Continuum album. There's a couple of tracks I've got that are like, you know, really, really, they are pretty much uplifting. They're as uplifting as I can do because I don't write uplifting music. I'm not very melodic as when I write music. So I write a lot more as you've heard, it's, I suppose it's more rhythmical and it uses a lot more bigger sort of big leads and yeah, but I produce with melodic artists and I've kind of learned over the years. And I think as a full on artist, I could be put to play anywhere between, you know, I could be put to play between two really light guys. So if I, if I don't have the ability, it comes down to being, I suppose, I don't really want to say professional in the creative process, but as a whole set, I want a range. So I can play after anybody or before anybody, lead into anybody, lead out of anybody, you know, keep the flow going. So especially as continuum, it's, I, I have a few long, longish breakdowns and a few tracks, like the two tracks with Encore, the new ones for the live set, the new live set I'll have soon. That's like a bit more uplifting, a bit of a longer break. You know, um, I've got a track, like you said, you mentioned the track with Score, but that's an even darker than I normally write with continuum because that's more his style. So it's kind of like, I have a basic idea. So even with the album, I had an idea. I wanted a few really fluffy tracks and a few, you know, there's going to be a few sort of 146, 147 BPM ones that are going to be the, in the middle of the album that are a bit darker. And yeah, I wanted a range and a journey and a flow and a structure of the album to be like sort of a proper journey. I, 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 like, I like you thinking there. Would you, when you're producing a longer, say like, you know, a three or four track EP or an album, you're then looking to have different sort of moods through those different tracks like you've just said but what about your sound palette are you aiming to keep and retain your sound throughout or do you sort of are you quite happy diverging away from that and saying right well this palette's just led me down a different route it's going to sound totally different would you then put that out where albums are handy for artists in my opinion yeah which is why i've chosen to do the album again now because I've been away from Continuum quite a lot, albums are kind of like, for me, I don't know if people will agree with me, but part of an album for an artist is, is you're basically standing up in the middle of a room and going, this is my sound. This is what I am going to roughly sound like in the next however many years. And I know artists that have used albums to recreate their style, to recreate their sound. You'll always have you bits of your old style in you. Like I even use some of the old, really old, old sort of things I used to do. I still use big Tom drums in my fills, for example, just before sections drop. I've been doing that for, since I started producing and I've never really let, let go of it. But, you know, artists evolve and you evolve, you change, you find a better way of doing something or you find a nicer way of doing something or you go through certain sounds. So for me, writing the album is a few things. It's kind of like the, this is my sound, but it's also been a really, it's also a journey for the artists to, kind of you want to create new style new sounds and create new interesting ways to do your style because that's what you're selling your style is your product it's like your um you know it's 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 your branding yeah literally it's taken me 10 years to get to where I, to where i am now because i finally with the album with continuum i finally with this continuum album that i'm working on at the moment no release date because i've only got three or four solo tracks done at the moment but it's got to this point where I've actually, you know, I've got a style, I finally hit a style and I've hit a sound and you don't want to pigeonhole yourself, but you don't want to go too far away because that's what they follow you. That's why people come to see you at parties. It's true. Yeah. And that's the process that it does take a few years to cement, doesn't it? You know, the, the first track that you write might not necessarily sound the same as the second or third, 
but then it sort of almost comes a point, doesn't there, where it's like, like you say there, you've just found your sound and you're, you know, that'll be related to how you produce, how you get your inspiration, what you use to produce, et cetera. And then that sort of cements you as an artist and that's what people fall in love with and, and want to see, mate. So yeah, that, that makes total sense. Yeah, like the best example is, like I know some people who are writing sort of the Mormon Italians, Looney Moon style, and a couple of them, they're called the Horrids. It's basically forest music. That's why you get different projects. That's the best example of it. Two guys that wrote slightly lighter music wanted to write forest, you know, but for them, it might, I don't know why exactly, but for me, if I was going to write forest, I'd write under a different project because it's not Mutalians. There's elements of Mutalians in it, but it's not. It's a different style, a different sound. That's why I've got two projects, full on and the slightly darker sound. Yeah, it's an interesting point because no matter how big the artist, suddenly releasing music of a totally different ilk can confuse your fans i mean like if you go to the very very top end of the you know the big, biggest artists in the world someone like david bowie when he suddenly started putting out drum and bass all this dialogue like glam fans were like what are you doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, you know if you had done that under a different artist name or you know sort of evolved that and and made a different point of it rather than just saying yeah i'm still me but this is a totally different style of music you know, it can confuse people. So yeah, I can see why people use different artist names. Makes sense to a point. It's a very, very subjective thing though, isn't it? Because I can also see why some people say, well, no, this is me creatively and it's just another page in my journey. So I'll just stick to, you know, st stick to me and this is, you know, and it becomes a bit more heart on sleeve then, doesn't it? Yeah, like what I really like, for example, about going to see a Zenon prog artist called Evil Oil Man is his last album he did two dub tracks, something like six or seven straight up prog and techno prog tracks, and two or three sort of mid-tempo ones. And then he even did one with an artist called Chris Rich, which is just, you know, night music. And that's what I like about the Zenon style is every Zenon artist, they always have breakdowns that have influences from breaks and dub. And it's actually what influenced me the most about doing a new DJ project was this whole Murky Aura project I mentioned at the beginning of the interview. The main yeah. focus is basically like Zenon prog, dark prog and the techno stuff. but you know, if someone said, oh, would you mind doing a mid-tempo set? I could easily incorporate it and even drop a free Evil All Man tracks in it and, you know, mix it up a bit. And the alternative stage won't mind so much. So it's kind of why I like that, that style. Because, you know, I, I know, uh, for example, the breaks scene. You've got like Nanosphere now, which is pretty much sort of more mid-tempo breaks. You've got even like Head Flux is pretty much more chilled breaks on a whole. But you can build a whole journey across multiple crazy BPMs and stuff, and that's what I, that's what really influenced me the most about DJing that music. Nice. And, and is that something we're going to expect more from you? Are you going to be pushing out I'm as a DJ? Trying. <laughs> I'm trying, being really busy with, you know, trying to get a set for each of it together. It is a thing. I have been collecting music for it. I've been experimenting at home, but I haven't got round to kind of sitting down and mixing a set together and you know constructing a set for the dark prog and the techno side i've been collecting this sort of mid-tempo chill out music for so long that i could probably do it but again um i'm just so busy at the moment with production that i kind of don't really have the time to put to it at the moment yeah you've got to, to some extent have a focus haven't you and if that's what you know is getting you the bookings and what you enjoy and how you can naturally sort of fill your time with the production and whatnot yeah why would you divert from that I've worked with, you know, like when I've done DJ workshops and stuff in the past with young up and comers and you almost see they've got this like, I call it like the ideas fairy. They've got so many different trains of thought that they want to pursue down, but then they've not necessarily got the experience or discipline to know that any one of those routes would probably take them to where they want to go. They just need to focus on that one thing. So you can see why, you, you know, you've not got time to focus on DJing and focusing on the production but then you're reaping the dividends aren't you loads of production out you know loads of recognition working with multiple labels and that's a good lesson to any up-and-comers i think that are listening yeah like even in production i've got a few friends and you know they've written a really cool trance track and then they'll write a cool chill track and they'll just jump all over these different styles and then they'll sit there and they'll be like don't really know what i want to write next <laughs> and then I, I just say to them i say well you need to focus you've got you know you've got what well, if it's a 20 year old you've got the next 50 years like you know you don't have to stay in that one thing 
you know, like, so I, I, I tell them focus on one and then, you know, when you're move along to another. Yeah. yeah. Like I've always wanted to write breaks. And a friend of mine came up to me on the dance floor and said, how do you write a side trance bass line? So I, I turned around to him and said, I know, I'll make a deal with you. <laughs> it, we'll write a breaks track and then you write, you know, and then we'll, we'll do a, a side trance bass line afterwards. And I did it and, you know, we, we've actually kind of played around over the last year and a half. We've done like six studio sessions and got two breaks tracks that he's going to mix in the next few weeks and don't really know what to do with them because I don't want to put them out under normal names. But, you know, but the point was, was I've, I've learned so much from, from mixing to sound design. It, I've noticed that the breaks element is creeping into the album with like the breakdowns. And there's a track actually, the track on um, Twin Realities, the one with Cambium, the Continuum one, it's got this sort of breaksy, almost chill out style breakdown for a bit, you know? So he actually did it, but I was really happy he did it because it, I've noticed it's starting to sneak in. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see it, that sound uh, as it evolves because, you know, like you mentioned earlier, before side breaks, it was just breaks and then it went a little bit progressive and then, you know, obviously there's people like Rennie Pilgrim and whatnot pushing it on and on the more side scene, there was, you know, people like Mood Deluxe and whatnot who were pioneering in those early years. But I think it is starting to come back a little bit and it fell out of favour for a while. No, there's just not many side, there's not actually many side breaks producers. Exactly, exactly. And it just sort of fell into the periphery. But then it started to sort of regain slowly a bit of momentum. And I think there's people that have always been ticking away doing their thing. Bad tango, head flux, et cetera. The way it works for them, though. What was that? In a way, certain things work for them. Like, it did, um, yeah. You know, like the main example I like is um, Triplicity Festival, their alternative stage. I call it the best alternative stage. Well, and sort of, I don't know about Anthropos, but for me, I love their, their lineups each day because they've got breaks, they've got mid tempo, they build up to the breaks and techno stuff. And I think it works for the breaks guys because, you know, if you want that sort of breaks bit to slot into your lineup, you're going to call on Bad Tango, Head Flux, Tummy Talk, Nanosphere, Qua, you know, because that's their thing. I think when it, there's too many artists, it, gets a bit but breaks could do with a few more artists or even projects just to buff it out a bit i think yeah when a scene or a musical genre sort of gets to a certain age i think there is always a danger of it collapsing in on itself unless some new blood comes through you know and it's i suppose hard house is a really good example of that it stagnated for a while when it was just totally dominated by a dozen big names and it was the same lineup constantly and, I, you know, that's one reason I have feared for the sort of longevity of the Cytron scene is when you see the same lineups, you know, whether it be side breaks or whatnot, you think, well, brilliant. They're very, very good at what they do and all credit to those artists. But you can't maintain a scene and, and keep new people involved and, and keep that energy fresh by listening to the same artists. And, and, you know, there's got to be like new blood that comes through at some point and, you know, it's nice that it's about to experience another revival, I think, and there is some fresh energy coming through. That's awesome. That means it's going to survive, right? Yeah, like breaks, especially. Um, I think Psytrance, it's, you know, like I said, I've been doing it for 10 years. It's, it's, it's a very long, you're thinking, you know, long, not quick. It's, it's a long thing that you, you refine your sound and it's a really long sort of process through the creative and getting... You need to also balance, I suppose, when you're coming up, going to parties with, you know, going to meet people and that whole argument of meeting people and that sort of thing with sitting in the studio. Yeah, there's, I mean, when I was young and, and sort of just getting into DJing as a, as a teenager, I'll not say when, donkey's years back, some of the advice I was getting from people sort of mentoring me through the process and introducing me to, you know, the wider industry you know, people at the time were saying that this was pre-social media. They were saying that deals were made at the after party. And that sort of almost put a pressure on you to be at all the parties, go to the after party, you know, make your face known, put yourself in front of people. And I think that's one thing that's changed with, you know, the advent of social media is you can be putting yourself in front of people without having to compromise on studio time you can find that balance you know you don't have to be basically partying for six months of the year right the way through festival season for fear of you know people forgetting who you are 
and then spending all winter in the studio trying to catch up desperately on uh, on your productions for fear of you know getting left behind so you know that's definitely a positive you know in finding balance with social media yeah as long as you find a balance because i know too many people spend too much time on social media and not enough time in the studio <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I could probably name a few people that are guilty of that. But I've got a few mates that write amazing music, but it's not quite the in thing at the moment. And plus, they're useless at social media. There's got to be a balance, hasn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's, yeah, I'm not, for, I'm not that great at the social media side. I've done a little bit of work and currently doing a remix for a chap who's, um, if you go on his Discogs, he's got, you get bored of scrolling through the pages, talking. Okay dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of albums hundreds of singles and it's ridiculous but you go on his social media and it's last post april 2017 or something and it's like you know unless you're really into this specific guy you just would not know how you know prolific he's been and it's it's absolutely crazy and i think there's got to be that balance you know finding time to produce but then also making people aware and i think you've got almost a responsibility to your fans to put stuff in front of them and say look here's how you can get it it's easy to download here you've got no excuse yeah that's the other thing it comes back to the making things as easy as possible <laughs> and that's what and, and that's what social media did for like specifically on that sales point of view because you can exactly. literally just make it so easy for people you could just put the link there and literally you just got to click the link click and then done but it's also for your videos for everything try and make it as easy as possible so they just click and it takes them at most to one page and that's it exactly mate exactly right quick change of pace before we wrap up little mini quick fire round uh, this is something i've done for a while with our interviews and we did it right the way through when we were putting stuff out on skiddle to this recent series of interviews four super quick questions yeah okay first one Top three things you never go to a gig without. Don't think. Oh, that's... <laughs> if I don't think, it's difficult. <laughs> Laptop, backup. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, if I don't wear a hat, half the scene in the UK won't even recognise me. Uh, you got the, the, the trucker cap style, haven't you? I've got... I, I just wear hats, so army hats, trucker hats. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I definitely know you for the drug arts. Right, man, next one. If you could only play at one of these for the rest of your life, where would it be? Club or outdoors? Outdoors. No, no hesitation there. <laughs> <laughs> if, I could get, if I could get to... If I could go to every single country that had their summer, I would. <laughs> Post-production, analogue or digital? I don't do mastering. You don't do mastering? I don't do my own mastering, no. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cancel the quick fire rounds just to ask you a bit more about that. What's your logic? I'm not good enough when there's people like Sco AD Scorb, EVP, Domestic, who do it way better. Yeah. Better uh, we might be, uh, what do you mean by mastering though? Because um, like, I'm talking about I make the track, I get it to minus four to six dB and then send it to a mastering engineer who essentially makes it louder and a bit bigger and fatter. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, so there's two logics behind it. I'm not very good at it. Um, it's a whole art and skill in itself. It's a dark art, mate. It's a whole art and skill in itself. And the second reason is, all the people that I work with generally, on a regular basis, it's a good way to detach yourself from the track and to get a second opinion. Non-biased opinion. Yeah, like, um, Scorb is the guy that I use most. And he'll always write back a few pointers and, you know, he'll, he'll say, oh, you've got too much frequency here or you've got too much there. Makes his life easier. You learn a little and then you get a second perspective on it because you might have been working on it for three weeks and you just want to get it out and done. You can get a little bit blind, can't you, to stuff that's so obvious you've missed it. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, um, but also just quite simply, it's, it's a skill in itself, a very, very, very unique skill. And you've got to spend years refining it and being good to be good at it, to be great at it. Yeah, 100% agree, mate. But before we wrap up, just quickly for your fans, I mean, we'll link all this below in the comments and description of this broadcast. But where is the best place for people to check you out on social media? Uh, Facebook and Instagram is the best. I've recently got, I'm recently got around to kind of starting to. 
rebuild my YouTube channel. I'm even debating just having all of it on one channel so I don't have to have multiple ones. We'll, uh, we'll link to those below. And of course, we're going to have your top 10 out on Spotify as a playlist. So everyone listening, be sure to check that out. Links below. And uh, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time. I know you're busy. Thank and, you very uh, much. It's been it's a pleasure been, as well. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Listen, I'll speak to you soon, no doubt. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, all the best, buddy. Yes. See you later. Yeah, later. Thanks very much. Strange Radio, bringing you the best in psycho-interactive